Welcome back to Anna Mondays. I'm your host, the JJ, and we're gonna hop right into it. Stardust Crusaders Part Two, JoJo, obviously, and I think this came out either in 2014 or 2015. I'm an idiot and didn't write the proper date this time. Starting off strong. So we pick up at F episode five. It's where we left off, and uh, we pick up with Polnareff about to show the group his strength. He's really, sh it's it's a real. The battle started to kick in. It's no longer, hey, can I see the kanji on this menu? It's more, I'm gonna shove this kanji down your throat. To show off his strength, he, in a very weird way, shish kebabs coins. But it's not just coins, because it's a shish kebab. Coins are the meat, the vegetables are fire. 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 <laughs> the, the amount of bullshit is actually amazing with this one. So Polnaroff legit warps from where he was standing when he did that move to the door. And it's absolute, again, bullshit. We never see this power. This would have been useful later. Hey, uh, as well as a couple other things I'm going to mention in this uh, group of episodes. We could have used this to beat Dio later as a group. No? Yeah, Alright. This is like, I'm not the only one who questions this. Even Avdol's like, wait, what the fuck? Am I drunk? Did I drink? What the hell just happened? Basically, Polnaroff says, fuck it, we're gonna head to an open space if we're gonna fight, there's no point in, this, in uh, destroying this establishment. Showing that he actually has honor, some valor, it's not all Dio in there. Yeah, and the, the way they do this is they actually build excitement to this. It's just very slow, drawn-out speech of just, well, then we should go here. Maybe we shall. Oh, okay. Why are we talking this slow? It's just there to elongate the conversation, make you, like, uh, make you antsy. That's the best way to put it. Make you anticipate the fight that's about to happen. Oh, God, it's almost here. And uh, it, it kind of works, because I, I find myself getting more and more pumped for this. And more and more just, just, you know, get to it already. In a good way, not a bad. The place they go to, beautifully colored background. Beautifully colored background. All these painted rocks and statues and... Really gorgeous background. Backgrounds are very important, um, unless you're Tite Kubo, and then you just don't do them. But um, uh, when you do, it's nice to have ones that actually pop, and this one really, you know, pops. So Polnaroff and Avdal are fighting, and uh, Polnaroff comes up at bat with his sword, and you see the flames coming towards him at 90 miles per hour, and... Oh, that's a baseball! Gotta love English. But somehow when he baseballs the fire back and hits the statue, the statue crumbles, and in one shot you see it completely crumbling. There's like nothing left over. It, 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 but it's cut very quick, so you could tell this was kind of like a, eh, moment. Almost getting Perot there, David. Try not to. But um, you see that the statue crumbles, and in the next scene you see that it crumbled to reveal Magician's Red. Fucking, really? I find this scene so ridiculous because you see like two or three things hit it, it crumbles, and then it's just fucking Magician's Red. And they say it's like from his flurry of attacks beforehand, maybe loosening it. I really did, it didn't look like that at all. It looked like the fire hit it, and now it's a statue, yay! So Abdal melts the joints of that statue, because this is how things work. Oh, if you're gonna make a statue of me, I'm gonna use it. Oh, one-upsmanship, Jojo in a nutshell. So the fire hits the statue, it became a Magician's Red. Magician's Red is fighting Silver Chariot. Silver Chariot beats Magician's Red. Turns out, it was the statue! Hi! <laughs> Makes no fucking sense. It makes- this is the biggest bullshit that I've seen Avdal do so far. Polnaroff survives by removing Silver Chariot's armor and showing that its speed is- is actually increased if he does so. Which, now that I think about it, I think we see maybe one more time in the series, so we actually see this multiple times. Yay! Bringing back stuff that should be brought back. Uh, it moves so fast, and this is absolutely an anime cliche, probably just a cliche in general, I'd say, but it moves so fast it made copies of itself. Woo! yay! Can we do something different with speed? Like, when you see something like the Flash, who has, like, such OP powers because of, like, vibrating molecules and stuff, can we just start twisting stuff into speed uh, powers that are akin to that? Not that, because it would get too OP, but, like, stuff along the lines of, like, phasing through objects and stuff, because I feel like just regular speed and the multiplying thing, been there, done that way too many times, at least in, for my taste. I'm starting to get kind of bored of it. Uh, yeah, no, it's a shame that, uh... Polnaroff gets he aid and, you know, we never get to see half of his fucking abilities again, because this multiplication one, you could add that to the list of stuff that'd be helpful if we fought Dio. So, Avdal eventually beats Polnaroff, as you would assume, because it's our hero team versus this schmuck. We get a very powerful scene of, of Avdal handing him the, 
he's on fire, first of all. Let's get that one out of the way. He's burning to a crisp. So Avdal just, yeah, probably be a lot less painful if you did it this way. Drops the dagger. Bulnorf picks up the dagger. Looks at it. Thinks about throwing it into Avdal's back. Puts it to his own neck. No. Like, he just flat out accepts his fate as fire. It'd be disrespectful to you to kill myself this way. It'd be disrespectful to me to kill myself, period. And it just... It's a very deeply powerful scene for me. And the first time I watched this, it just kind of was like, yeah. But when I'm actually reviewing this, and I'm actually seeing the character of Polnaroff here... Tops, man. I think this is honestly probably... Did I just say tops? Am I from the 90s or 80s? What the fuck? Point is, he's really fucking awesome. I, I think this was the cool... Hey, Polnaroff, join our team point. And apparently Abdal does too, because he does. Why the fuck did I say tops? So we find out Polnaroff was obviously also being controlled by uh, Lifebud, or whatever those were called, the controlling things. And um, But this time, his respect actually shone through. It shined through. It, it, um, it was so powerful that the dampening literally didn't do anything. It was still there and present, and that's why Abdal couldn't bring himself to do it. There's a reason that Polnaroff has such a captivating storyline, and I think that's because he's one of the only ones with a major complete arc in the series. And, again, we'll get more into it later on. Yo, I'm gonna be the fifth man in your cliche anime squad. You got a problem with that, Kakyo? No? No? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So they invite the newbie in, and the newbie tells him the story. Uh, his story is about his sister, and he wants revenge uh, because he's looking, he's looking for this guy with two right hands. And... They say it's specifically a guy, I know it's a man, blah, 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 like the way they tell the story. And it's just, they deliberately lie to the audience in that way. And it's only for like two episodes. Two episodes later, you find out who it is. And big surprise here, it's Enyaba! The one who watches people have sex? Does that mean with his sister? She, I don't want to get into it. I don't want to get into it. I don't want to get into it. In all fairness, though, the line to the audience, I complain about that a lot. This is where it's done right, because why the fuck would Polnaroff know that it was a man or a woman? He's just sort of assuming it's a man. And you could argue that that's maybe a problem, but not really, because most of the people that we've seen with stands and, and abilities, at this point, almost all of them, if not all of them, have been men. You, you've seen Holly... And, uh, it's the only female I can think of that we've seen that has a stand. Throughout the entire series, I can only think of maybe one or two more. So, uh, in Stardust Crusaders, that is. So, I mean, in all fairness, the thought process, I guess, is there for Polnaroff. I, I, playing devil's advocate there. Oh, we see Dio, we cut back to Dio, and he's got this bird on his shoulder, who is named Pet Shop. We don't know that yet. He comes back much later. And if he just showed up now, while Dio was previously talking about, you know... Let's try and get some more uh, people to stop JoJo. You have that whole thing. Then you also have the idea that a few episodes ago, I was totally seeing Dio with dogs with human heads. Putting something together here. Never said once in the series, I don't think. But So if he's doing that with human heads, he's experimenting on animal and human hybrid. Uh, basically, he's trying to combine them. Now, with that in mind, Pet Shop thinks like a human. We've seen human reactions from Pet Shop. We've seen Pet Shop think not like an animal, especially a bird. Did Dio make Pet Shop using human brains? Did he maybe take human intelligence and, and again, the brain and put it inside of Pet Shop? Was that why we showed the dogs and the animals before? They're on a boat. And, um, you know, because the plane worked so well. And they get on that and they're on their way to Singapore, I believe it is? Uh, Joseph makes a funny remark about Jojo and Kakyoin always wearing their school u uh, school uniforms, where it's just, why the fuck are you still wearing those? We're on a boat. You must be like, it must be like 90 degrees out. You must be dying. Kakyoin, this is... Hmm. You may be true. You may be telling the truth, old man. But we are students. And students should always look as such. You know, that may sound like a load of shit. And that's not me saying that. Kuck Yoen practically says, I'm paraphrasing, but he practically says, ah, that seems forced to you, right? Yeah, it does. Thanks, writers. Guess we'll never get an answer to that one, aside from we don't want to draw extra costumes. We get our intro to female Smokey, who from now on we will just refer to as Famoki. And uh, she's a stowaway on the ship. Don't know it's a girl yet. Uh, just assume it's a girl doing a little boy's voice until we get our 
boob touch of this episode, which, yeah, surprisingly is a trope. <laughs> Japan likes to feel a lot of boobs. Pimp country. So, she bites, the, she bites the guy that finds her hand, and they toss her off the ship. Fuck you, you're not dealing this. I told you no stowaways. Um, in fact, the crew that's on here right now, JoJo's gang, they asked for not a lot of people, and, you know, people that we all accounted for, because, you know, stands. So, as she's off, she's thrown off, she's about to drown, Jotaro rushes to save Fomoki from a shark. Oh, if she's drowning, that's fine, let her drown. But if it's a shark, no, I gotta do something. That's just respect. Goes to grab her, and accidentally realizes, oh, that's... He's a she. You know, we just touched, and in Japan, that practically means we're bonded for life, so... Won't get married? Does anyone else notice that in anime? If two characters touch, like, skin to skin, or, like, falls on top of each other, they're instantly bonded for life in Japan. Done. Married. So, so Femoki pulls out a knife. They're all questioning her on the ship once they're back on it. And she just, come on, motherfuckers. Each one of you. I'll take you on one at a time, you shits. Almost an exact line. And they're all just having a conversation in their head. Should we have saved her? I don't know. Should we? This bitch is crazy. I, and then Kakyo just answers someone else. They're having a mind conversation. They're telekinetically speaking to one another. When the fuck was this a thing? So, Jotaro is kind of 50-50. He's either a genius or a complete moron that wins by luck. And it really is sporadic. It's sometimes he's one, sometimes he's the other. So he lights up his cigarette on the ship, to which the captain walks over, grabs the cigarette. I'd appreciate it very much, so if you didn't smoke on my ship. Because what were you going to do, huh? You're going to throw the butt over the, over the side of the ship? You're going to... Dirty or beautiful ocean, you fucking mook. Jotaro. Hmm. You know, you could have just, you know, put it out. That's one thing. You didn't have to be such a condescending prick about it. However, come here. Because I know now, without a shadow of a doubt, you are the stand. He bluffs his way by saying, All cigarette smoke causes a vein to pop out on all stand users' nose. And then you see all the people who have stands go, Oh! So the captain literally goes, oh, I've been found out, goes to dive overboard, which I think is amazing, uh, taking this to the sea, and by the time he hits sea, he is already beaten vigorously and viciously by Jotaro. You see them floating away, to which I, I thought, like, yo, he's water, that's not gonna, you didn't beat him if he's in the water, that's just not, it, come on. Though, on the other side, I would have really laughed and liked it if that really was the end of him. Not everyone's gonna put up a fight. Not everyone's whole horse, who you'll meet later, who comes to multiple fights. So, Jotaro winds up getting, bottom line here, dragged to the bottom of the sea. <laughs> bottom line. And sees the captains waiting for him, along with his fish stand. Mermaid fuck. I've seen this whole fighting underwater for breath thing. Uh, oh, I gotta get to the top, because if, if I don't beat him or get to the top, I'm gonna run out of air. I don't know what it is about those. Those just don't hit me. Ever since I first saw that in One Piece with Arlong, and it is done a lot. It's done frequently. I've seen it enough to know, oh, it's this thing. Not my thing. I really don't appreciate those. I just think they're boring. A time battle? Fine, but when it's a time battle underwater, I don't know what it is. It just doesn't strike me. It's very... meh. I don't know why. I... I I'm saying that is a personal thing only, though. I, I will put that out there. It just does nothing for me. When JoJo's caught in the whirlpool, the animation here was actually really good. This is how you know it wasn't Perot. The, the spin, it's like you see him and he's already over here, and then that slowed, oh, and he's already over here. It had weight to it. It felt like actual rotation. The angle was, was chaotic because it was tilted. I love it. I love it. And the character wasn't fucking Perot fucked up. I get that the fish stand user can breathe and talk underwater, but then JoJo starts doing it. Like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> this, is, this is some bullshit right here. So we end up with the ship blowing up because the captain said bombs, I guess to his heartbeat, maybe? Not entirely sure. Don't think the detonator would still work underwater, so I'm going to assume it was his heartbeat. And as they're floating in the water on their buoy, their little extra ship, they're floating along, and they see this big, creepy, ghost-like ship appear out of nowhere, a freighter. 
and it's clearly not a stand. It's not, so whatever you... I know I've done this bit a lot, but it's get used to it because they're not stands. It's just not stands. That monkey you're going to see on the ship is not a stand user. It's not a stand. You know, if you walked to Egypt at this fucking point, you probably would have been better off. Oh, there's water. We need to get across water. Just swim. Honestly, easier at this point. You won't have to transition vehicles as much. Waste an extra hour. Episode 7, moving on to that. We find out that Anyaba told Dio about his stand and taught him how to use it. So, in all fairness, erase that complaint I had in a previous review. That explains how he had it. Jonathan didn't know about it. So we learned about the seven henchmen Dio sent to stop them, which I like. I like when series do this trope. This is a good trope, for at least in my opinion. You set up X number of guys, and you have to get through those number of guys. And the thing I like about that is you can always add more. You know what I mean? It's always, okay, so we beat the seven. They beat the seven? Or they're about to beat the seven? Okay, let's go Let's go make twelve. You, you can move the goalpost as a villain with this, and not in a cheap way, especially with Dio, because we find out how he's doing it, and it's... You want, you want a group of, of sand users, call 20 guys in your office, shoot them with a bow and arrow, and at least five of them will come out fucking useful. They run across a, a suspicious primate in a cage, which, and say it with me, ladies and gentlemen, is not a stand or involved with stand. He's a fucking stand user. God damn it, when are we going to learn? Probably fucking... Uh, probably by the light socket. Honestly, probably by the fucking light socket. Oh, Fumoki goes over to this ape, you see her, you know, giving it more of the once-over, she's actually looking at it, talking to it, oh, your monkey is cool. And the monkey, and I, I really can't stress this enough, that I'm not making a joke or a fun little, ha <laughs> hi, he reads Playboy and smokes. The monkey, this is me now, the monkey, Playboy, cigarettes. Still not suspicious. <laughs> so, from that, I'm going to continue the monkey and, and Fumoki, since they're, a main, they're pretty much the main storyline in this episode. The, uh, the monkey really creepily starts watching Fumoki take a shower, which is also creepy, aside from the monkey watching, because I really don't, we don't see her really as a girl yet. I think the scene is so that you see her in a different light, and then the monkey... Makes this a whole other level of creepy. Monkey tries to do the un unthinkable when Jotaro stops him, uh, but then gets a fan in his shoulder, cause big surprise, the ship was a stand! It was a surprise to no one! I will say that it's refreshing to see these seri this series go into places that no other series wants to go into. Um, like a, a monkey watching a girl take a shower. I didn't ask for it, I don't want it, but the fact that it's here, okay. Can't get this anywhere else. The fact that... I saw a ship come to life and throw a propeller, a uh, fan blade, into someone's shoulder. <laughs> Never saw this before. I saw a guy speak at the bottom of an ocean to another guy while they fight with magical things that stand by them. Did this... unique. <laughs> so I will say it's refreshing. JoJo is very refreshing in that aspect. A fly on a plane. Um, a ship captain with bombs attached to his heartbeat and a water stand. And now a ship stand being controlled by an ape. Well, we have our, we have our answer where our originality went. Died with this series, because you couldn't get any more fucking creepy and original than this. I like the ape when he comes out dressed as the sailor, the captain, and he's got like this captain's uniform. He He's trapped uh, Jotaro. He thinks he's already won, so he's cocky as shit. Smoking a pipe and playing with a Rubik's Cube. That's just, like, the most amazing thing ever to me. Jotaro knocks off a button, starts taunting the ape, damaging its pride. The ape jumps at it, lunges at it like it's vicious, because it's still a fucking animal, after all. Jumps at it, and Jojo uh, uses Star Platinum to hit the button. Button like a bullet launches through his head. Monkey starts flipping out and crying. Why did we do all of this? Why did we do it to that aspect? Couldn't you just, you know, finger him through the, the skull and you, you would have beaten him? So he beats the shit out of the monkey, and we reveal that Anyaba's got the two right hands, I mentioned it before, and the group will eventually arrive at Singapore, finally, that's how we end the episode. We uh, end a tease of a doll. Wonder what that's gonna be? It's a doll and they're teasing it, so? When they arrive at Singapore, I really enjoy the culture in the series. I think that's the best part. We go so many different places, and each place feels cultural. It's just, oh, okay, Singapore. This is Singapore. Okay, so when we get into Egypt, this is Egypt. 
Okay, so when we get to uh, Hong Kong, this is Hong Kong. It just feels... It feels very slightly, and I mean very slightly, educational. And in the, in the other aspect, it just feels... Hmm... R reset. Feels like a reset. That's the best way to put it. It's just... Hmm... Singapore. Fresh air. New place. Hmm... Hong Kong. Fresh air. New place. Move on to episode 8. We start with two great comedy gags, one of a cop mistaking Polnar Ross luggage for garbage. Just, sir, littering's illegal here. You can't have that. Are you talking about my bag? Come here. <laughs> Just like that very angry Polnar Ross moment. Great. Then right after you find out, oh, uh, Joseph walks over to Polnar Ross. Oh, Famoki's probably poor. Um, should you know, should we... I guess pay for her hotel room and stuff until her dad she's meeting up with? Should we do that? Just go over there and tell her we're gonna do that. Just don't be rude. Don't break her pride. So Polnaroff just walks over and just flat out, Oh, you're poor, right? Okay, well come with us. We'll pay for your shit. So you have a scene basically explaining why Polnaroff would be in his own room. Um, the two students are together, Avdol and Joseph are together, and Femoki's in her own room. Uh, because she's a woman, why would she share with Polnaroff? And I like that, it makes perfect sense, and it also gets Polnaroff alone, which is what we need. Polnaroff enters his room, checks everywhere smartly, you're learning, hey, anything could be a stand. Gets to the deck, you know, the sliding door that's in all hotels. Gets to the deck, stands out. Hmm. You're not gonna leave us alone, you're not gonna let us rest, are you? And then out from the fridge pops our villain for this episode. The tenacity of Dio and the way that they have all the bottles on the fridge and it's just, how did you know you're an idiot? It's just all really fun, really well done. And again, the tenacity of a villain is needed. Good job, Dio. Keep sending them. Don't let them rest. So basically we see Polnaroff fucks him up, damages him, sends him flying out the window, and we keep getting these ominous shots on the puppet, who, Again, it's very clearly the guy's fucking stand. It's his fucking stand. I don't know why we're doing this. Don't show the fucking puppet. Don't make it seem like it. Ooh, this is gonna matter. No, make it a surprise. Polnaroff gets attacked. He, he gets sliced in the back of the leg after dispatching of the guy. And keyword there is after, so he's confused. Hmm, I don't remember getting cut. Whatever. Calls room service. Then calls Av uh, Avdal and, and Joseph to tell them to tell Jotaro. We need to get shit planned out. I'm already getting attacked. Uh, which, by the way, I do have to mention, before I get to my actual point here, everything seems fair. Everything seems like actual rational decision-making in this aspect. In this aspect. Again, you should assume everything's a standby now, but at least when something happens, oh, let me call my person, eh, okay. It's not just, let me deal with this alone, which is also a cliche. My main point that I wanted to mention with the sentence I started was, why doesn't Avdal tell him about all the shit with Soul Sacrifice? He knows about it, because he hangs up, looks at Joseph, and then starts narrating. Tell this to the guy who's potentially gonna die by him! He's fighting him now! So the cool part about this is, uh, we see Chucky the Singaporean doll, and he's basically like the Hulk, but with grudge instead of anger, which we could argue is still technically anger-based. So it's basically, ironically, the world's smallest Hulk doll. Um, every time you damage the, the stand user, Soul Sacrifice, he... Uh, I guess it makes the doll, like, more fast or more powerful of some kind. They don't really delve into the actual ability increase, but the more he has a grudge against you, the more you're screwed. I believe that's what they say. So Polnaroff winds up getting trapped under the bed, tied up, and then you see the little puppet running around, cutting each, uh, sawing each leg of the, the bed off so that the bed falls, and the weight traps Polnaroff. Clever way to trap Polnaroff. At least they're doing some refreshing, uh, unique things with these tropes. That's that's the ultimate thing with JoJo. Is it may have started, it's older, so it may have started some of these tropes and maybe proponing, uh, 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 maybe a proponent for them. But at the same time, at least it's adding interesting things. It's adding bizarre elements. It's making it so that it's not just those tropes. Room service eventually shows up because that call actually comes through, and you see the puppet hiding above the door. Uh, you don't actually see the, the puppet, but you see its shadow. And this scene is just fucking creepy. Super creepy. Uh, you see the shadow of the room service. Hey, something... Oh my god, what's going on in here? And then you see the, the razor blade slowly. It's almost psycho-esque. Genius. You don't show it, and that's a good way to get around the censorship. It's a good way to get around uh, it looking sort of goofy, since it is a puppet. But that shadow, the silhouette, is the right amount of creepy. 
beautifully done. And it outdoes a lot of horror movies. 90% of horror movies these days. So, Polnaroff winds up pulling a classic JoJo. He gets himself cut free and starts weirdly planning this whole thing with breaking glass and scattering it. And It's not very, uh, you don't catch it right away, but it, last minute you see the reflection of Polnaroff through a piece of glass, who's looking up at the ceiling, still trapped under the bed. And, uh, He's looking through the glass to see where he can stab the puppet. And it's just a really nice... It, it seems like the... the I almost said the first JoJo. The second JoJo, Joseph. It seems like young Joseph, where it was just... What the fuck? We're going through all this just to get this weird plan of tying a knot together? What? The, JoJo's this weird level of realism along with its bizarre uh, nature. For example, Polnaroff getting taken in by the police and questioned for the two dead bodies that are in his room, both the stand user and the... The, um... The, what's it called? The, um... The room service guy, sorry. Don't know why my brain decided to shut down there. Is my brain a stand? Oh my god, is my brain a stand? Oh, you figure, wow, Polnaroff's fucked. I guess this is the end of the line for Polnaroff. Nothing but butt rape and uh, nasty lunches for him, I guess, right? And cigarettes to the forehead? Look, Jotaro's got that one covered already. Thanks, sea captain. But, uh, you have all this shit happening. You're just thinking, how the fuck does he get out of this? When all of a sudden the door busts open. Doom, 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 doom. Central Speed Wagon Intelligence. Yes, he's saved by the Speed Wagon Foundation, who just comes in and is apparently able to get you out of murder. Two murders. Anyone else think that this uh, foundation is horrifying and could easily become a villain later on? And I really hope they do that. That'd be really interesting. They have way too much power, and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. So in the end of this episode, Hermit Purple is used to hear the words, There is... A traitor amongst you, Kakyoin Dio's servant, and it's on different channels, going through each channel, a word per channel. Really kind of cool. I like the way they do this. It's not the same as a spirit photo, it's spirit audio, um, even though they are showing pictures and stuff too. But the idea of this is slightly different, and I was wrong, I have to put it out there, he does break this TV. Though I, the way they do it, it seems like Dio almost breaks the TV, just kind of like, mmm. You know what I mean? His energy just surges. When we pan to Kakyoin, again, setting up, he's a traitor, you see that he's behind jo uh, Jojo and Famoki, and you just see this very, like, ominous, stalking look to him. This is one of my, like, I wouldn't say least favorite. i just say that the best part of the next episode that we're going to do in our next review is, uh, is a cherry, and that's all I'm gonna do, 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 do about that. So, uh, I think it'd be a very sad thing if Kakyoin actually were to be a, uh, a Dio servant and a traitor at this point, because he's an established member of the group. Uh, he, he's, he's been saved by Jotaro, so he's, uh, repaying him, he's turned a new leaf. Just everything about it is very, we, we're used to him. The audience has had enough time to adjust to him. And I think it's even smarter that we added Polnaroff in that interim, because now we have another new guy that we're a little unsure of. Is it Polnaroff? Could Polnaroff be the traitor? And then they say Kakioin, and it's, no! Yeah, that's all I really got this week. If you can, like and subscribe. Um, leave a comment below. I do want to ask you a question. If Even if you just comment the answer to this, that's fine with me. But uh, from next week on for Anna Mondays, I'm going to do something different. I want to just change this up a little bit. I want to start a marathon of some kind. And it's going to be different shows. It's going to be a very long one. But I don't know what to do yet. We're either going to do one of two things. I want to do one... Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. And then the other one I'd like to do...